Hi, everyone. Welcome to my talk. Um, so just a few things before I start. First of all, can everybody hear me OK? Yes? OK, wonderful. Uh, show of hands for me. Who here has used Perl before? Lots of you. Who here hasn't used Perl before? Awesome. OK, that's fantastic. So this is my talk on the Perl Renaissance. Um, I have, what is it, 45 minutes, I think, to, uh, to give you as much as I can. Um, that actually means that this is a somewhat condensed talk. So I would love to give you more information than what I have now. And uh, in fact, I'll make this promise to you that if you can find a way to get me to your, your user group or your Perlmongers group or whatever else, I will give a talk there. Um, in fact, you might have to sort of fight me a way to stop me from giving a talk there. Um, so if you can find me a, a way to get somewhere, I'll speak about this in, in more detail. So some of you might be wondering, uh, the Perl, the Perl what? You know, the Perl Renaissance, what is this thing? Um, well, sometime in the last couple of years, uh, Perl just became like completely and utterly awesome and amazing. <laughs> and, and like there is so much cool shit that's happening with Perl. And what's surprising is it's, it's very, very easy to have not noticed that. Um, so sort of outside this little sort of Perl bubble, uh, people haven't really heard about this. Now, one of the things which has uh, really made this, which has really driven this, um, are a whole bunch of new tools. And uh, it's not that the core language has changed, it's that the tools around the language have changed a lot. And uh, really, by using these tools, these have, have at least helped me become Superman. <laughs> so I'm just going to spend the rest of the talk uh, slightly disheveled. This is a, a Portland Pearlmongers uh, shirt, and they are amazing. So where do you find all the best tools? Um, you find them on the CPAN, uh, the Comprehensive Perl Archive Network. And um, for those of you not familiar with CPAN, there's like 26,000 distributions. And a distribution can contain multiple modules, and it's the reason for using Perl. Now, here's a talk, sorry, not a talk, here's a slide um, which has a graph that was made late last year, so 4th of December last year. This is the number of new distributions released to the CPAN per year. And for anyone who says, you know, it's slowing down, the amount of Perl development is slowing down, that is not a graph which is slowing down. That is a graph which has this really fancy curve that's going up there. And in fact, what's amazing is that there was even one distribution released in the future. <laughs> So clearly, there's like, you know, things happening even before the present. But the graph up until 2007 was slowing down. And now, it's, really and now whew, it's going back up. Yeah, that's actually a really good observation. And 90% of travel back in time. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're wondering what are these new modules, um, about 50% of them are actually updates. This is the number of uploads. So about 50 of these would be 50% is updates to existing modules. About 50% are completely new things. Uh, for those of you who have missed it, if you've been using search.cpan.org, MetaCPAN is like amazing. MetaCPAN, you can go there and it does all the stuff you want. You're looking at a module, you want to submit a bug, there's like one click to go to the bug tracker. Uh, you want to clone the source repository, there's one click to let you clone the source repository. Um, you can see what things depend upon and you can favorite things, which sounds like it's a really, really easy thing and like really simple, but it's so wonderful because you can say, oh, 50 people have favorited this module, it's probably more popular than this one that only five people have favorited. And you can keep your own favorite list, you can see other people's. Of course, the big problem with anything involved in the CPAN is installing modules. So who here has used the CPAN shell? The actual CPAN command. Okay, who likes the CPAN shell? Nah. Sometimes I get like people putting up their hands like, yeah, I like the CPAN shell. Who likes the CPAN shell on older pearls? without root, if you've ever had to do this, holy smokes, it's fucking awful. And like, I tried to use the CPAN shell the other day, and it's like, are you ready for a 50-page questionnaire on what your system is like? I'm like, no, don't do this to me again. So there's this thing called CPAN minus, CPAN M, which hopefully some of you have used. Um, I like CPAN minus more than I like ice cream. And, and I'm absolutely serious here. I would rather give up ice cream than give up CPAN minus. That's how amazingly good it is. So CPAN M runs on 5.8 and above, which hopefully you're using something more recent than 5.8. Um, it's written in pure Perl. It's got no dependencies whatsoever. And it works with local lib. And if you haven't encountered local lib, it lets you install all of your modules in a local directory, like inside your home directory. Um, you don't need any sort of special privileges. You can install them on a USB key. It's amazing. And the great thing about CPAN M is it's completely hands off. 
So if I want to install a module, and there's this module called Moose, some of you might have heard about, um, I just say, give me Moose. And it says, OK, well, I'm working on Moose. I'm downloading it. I'm configuring it. I'm building it. And I'm done. And I don't get these pages upon pages of output that I don't really care about. Um, if there's dependencies, it downloads the dependencies, and it installs those for me. And again, I don't have pages upon pages of output I don't care about. You have a question for me. That installs it locally. If I want to install it for everyone, it's cpanm dash dash sudo moose, which does exactly what you expect. It fires up sudo, and away you go. So this is fantastic. You can install pretty much everything from the cpan using cpanm. It's completely hands off. I adore it. There's one gotcha. How do you install cpan minus? Because <laughs> you sure as hell don't want to fire up the cpan shell, because that's the thing we're trying to avoid. Luckily, installing cpan minus. It's very, very simple. You go to this URL, which is really easy to remember because it's cpan minus. And what you do is you redirect that to a file, and it's installed. That gives you the source code for cpan minus. It's one single file. You redirect it to a file in your file system, and it's installed. If you want to, you can get fancy. You can do this sort of thing uh, where you actually redirect it to Perl, and it will go and check to see if there's updates and bug fixes and everything else. But really, you can just go to this page and save it. You should check the hash first, yes. Yes, don't be a cowboy. Also, this is wonderful if you want to install things on your entire system. The other gotcha is, you know, I'm working with Perl. Um, I might have something that I'm developing on. My target system, uh, what my, my deployment system is going to be, might be different. So one thing that you might want to end up doing is installing Perl itself. Now, in the same way that, uh, that cpanm and local lib lets you have a local install of Perl modules, there's this wonderful thing called Perlbrew. And Perlbrew lets you have local installs of Perl. And they can have independent directories with independent modules in all of them. And you don't need any special privileges. And all you do is you install Perlbrew using cpanm. Um, you then do a Perlbrew available. And it's like, here are all the versions of Perl that I know about. And you say, OK, cool. I want to install uh, 5.16.2. And it will install that for you. And then you can do things like, show me which ones I have installed. So here's the ones I've installed with Perlbrew. And then if you want to use a particular version, you just say, use this, and it starts up a shell where all the environment variables are set correctly so that you're using that version of Perl. It's fantastic. So for somebody like me, where I'm working on one version of Perl, but I need to deploy to other things, or in my case, I'm running Autodyne. It needs to work on every freaking version of Perl that you can run. Um, this is amazing for me to do local testing. Um, older versions, you could do this explicit Perl, Perl brew off. These days, you can just exit the shell. Now, the command which I really get excited about here um, is called Perl brew exec. You might go, well, what's Perlbrew exec? It is like super, super cool. And the reason it's super, super cool is what Perlbrew exec does is it takes a command. It doesn't have to be Perl, but usually it invokes Perl in some way. And it runs that on every version of Perl that you have installed with Perlbrew. So here I've got a simple hello world. I run that, and I get all my hello world messages from my different versions of Perl. But can you imagine doing this with your test suite? Suddenly, you've got eight different versions of Perl. You can test all of them with one command. It is marvelous, absolutely marvelous. So at this point, I've given you a lot of stuff sort of around writing, you know, installing things and installing Perl. Um, you probably want to be writing code. That's why you're here. I want to be writing code in Perl. So who's written code in Perl? I did this at the start. Lots of people. Who's written code in Perl which you shouldn't have need to have written? <laughs> yeah. Holy crap, there's a lot of that. Every time I have to like write a version number, I don't want to do that. Every time I have to attach a license, I know they're important, but I just don't want to have to write them myself. All of those standard tests you use everywhere, like every piece of software I write is going to run at a Perl critic. I have to install the Perl critic test. Oh my goodness, don't make me do that again. Um, things like figuring out your dependencies, things like uploading it to CPAT, it just becomes insane. All I want to do is write some damn code for my particular problem. So there's a little module out there called Module Starter. Some of you may have encountered this before. Um, what Module Starter does is it gives you like a, a scaffolding directory, a skeleton directory of here's all the things you need for a, a Perl module distribution. And if you run it, it gives you like all of these files of which you only really care about that one there. Every other file which is in this list, it's important that it exists. But as far as I'm concerned, that's some sort of time debt that I have to repay. That's something which I have to maintain and work on, which I really, really don't want to. So rather than showing you the old way of building modules in Perl and maintaining them, I want to show you Distiller. And Distiller absolutely changed my coding life. 
because this still made it easier for me to release modules to the CPAN than it was for me to tweet about releasing modules to the CPAN. It's amazing. And this was, was effectively titled Maximum Overkill for Perl Authors. That's its synopsis. So you can get it at dzil.org. And um, you run it the very, very first time. It gives you a setup screen. You give it like all of your details and everything. And you never have to do that setup again. Um, here is how you make a new module with Distiller. Diesel, my new module. And uh, it gives you exactly two files, one of which is this any file, which contains all the information for Distiller on how to build your module and do everything else. And the other one is the module that you actually care about, that file that you actually care about. If you actually want to turn this into a distribution that you know, you'd put in a tarball or that other people would use, you type diesel build, and it fills in all the other stuff for you. The manifest file, which you never, ever want to care about. Your readme file, which of course you never want to write yourself. Your license, which you don't want to have to write yourself. All that gets built for you. If you want to test things, you do a diesel test. If you do a diesel release, it pushes it to CPAN if it knows your username and password there. And you might be saying at this point, OK, you know, so what? You know, you've got a, yet another build system. Uh, it can do some fancy things, but why do I actually care? Why am I excited about this? Well, Diesel gives you a pluggable architecture. So what you can do is you can plug things into this build system to do whatever it is that you want to be doing. And that is all inside your Diesel.ini file. So here's my basic information for my distribution, uh, what it's called, what the version is, et cetera, et cetera. This thing in square brackets, that says, please include a stack of something. Please include a plugin. And at basic is actually a bundle of plugins, which are the basic bundle. It does things like write your readme and everything. This is really awesome. This is your Git plugin. Your Git plugin says you're not allowed to release it unless you've actually pushed all of your commits into your Git repository. It does things where when you do a release, it tags that release with your version number. It gives you the ability to find out what is your version number by looking at your Git repository at those version tags. So it's really, really freaking awesome. And it will do things where it's like, I've made a release. It pushes that up to GitHub for me. So now I have a whole bunch of basic stuff that I do in Git that happens automatically. This here figures out my prerequisites for me. So I never have to figure them out manually. When I push things to CPAN, it just works. This here means I never have to write my own package numbers. Um, I j it fills them in for me. It adds our version is whatever. Um, this here gives me Perl Critic. It's fantastic. This writes my pod for me. It's amazing. So you can add all of these bundles into Diesel, and it does a whole lot of your repetitive work for you. Now, of course, you might download someone else's distribution that uses Diesel. You need to have all these plugins on your system to be able to use them. How do you get them? Well, you ask Diesel, what are my author dependencies? And you just push them to CPAN minus. And then it just grabs them all and installs them all on your system. So this makes it delightfully easy to not only build and work with your systems, but it makes it easy for other people to work with them as well because this gives them all that build environment. So we're now actually going to talk about some actual code now that I've talked about distribution systems and everything. And I'm going to talk about object-oriented Perl. Who here has worked with object-oriented Perl? Some of you have. OK. Object-oriented Perl, not awesome. Object-oriented Perl is not even close to being awesome. And if you've sort of been in Perl for a while and you've seen the various iterations of object-oriented Perl, the problem is it's too flexible that uh, there's too many ways to be doing it. And of those too many ways, most of them are wrong, or they're stupid, or they're both. <laughs> and this, this was the state in the art of like Perl object orientation a few years ago. You know, you just kind of had to hope that nobody touched those hash keys or, you know, whatever else. And the rest of them were too hard. And in fact, if you look at the very early days of Perl 5.0, it really felt like it was bolted onto the side. Oh, we can, we can bless a reference to something, and that gives you method dispatch, and that's all you need for object orientation. So the Perl motto is there's more than one way to do it, uh, which of course you'll know is pronounced Tim Toady. And I'm going to be showing you Moose. And uh, Moose, who here has used Moose before? Some of you. Awesome. OK, some of you will be new to this. The Moose motto is there's more than one way to do it, but sometimes consistency is not a bad thing either. <laughs> and of course, it's pronounced Tim Toady bicarbonate. <laughs> so let's, let's see how we can use Moose. Let's look at some actual code. Um, to do a class in Perl, we create a package. And then Moose gives us this object framework. And once I've loaded Moose, that turns on strict. It turns on warnings. I don't have to do that myself. And then I can just start declaring attributes. So objects have attributes and methods, or classes have attributes and methods. 
um, has gives me an attribute. So my hacker has a surname, a given name, and a username. Moose takes care of building accessors for me. So these are going to be read writable for my surname and my given name, but read only for my username. I'm not going to let people change that. And Moose also comes with a type system. So all of these are strings, but I'll show you different types as we go through. There'll be different types later on. Now that is my entire class. There's no need for me to write a new method. There's no need for me to put anything else in there. That's my entire class, which has three attributes, which happen to be strings. To use that, I simply use my hacker file, and I can create it using new, giving it these key value pairs, which is how we're used to building objects in Perl. Moose does that for us. And then if I want to find out my username, I just ask for my username, regular method call there. So it's very, very, very quick with Moose to start writing objects. Now, of course, once I've written objects, one of the things which I want to do is have some way of being able to extend them. Now, there's a few ways of doing this. One is using inheritance, which I'll show you now. The other is by using roles, which I'll show you in a moment. So here, I'm using uh, my, I've got a package called Hacker Social, which will be a hacker that can talk to other hackers, and it extends hacker, so it's a subclass of hacker. And then I'm simply adding another attribute, which in this case is an email address, so hackers can email each other. Now if I've got a hacker social, I can do this. I can add an email address. Everything works fine. And of course, because that's a read-write attribute, I can change that as well. Now there is one gotcha with that code that I've written there, and that is it's not doing any validation on our email address. I just said my email address was a string. So somebody could pass in cheese sandwich, and I'd say, sure, that's a valid email address. It's not. So anytime I need to do validation, um, this is a good time for me to introduce uh, a constraint system or a type system. And so Moose has uh, this type system, this constraint system. And I'm going to write myself an email type. I'm going to do that by leveraging regex common, which already comes with a plugin for identifying valid email addresses. And then I have this piece of code here. I'm going to have a subtype called an email, which is a string. So anywhere I can use a string, I'm also allowed to use an email address because it's a type of string. And it's considered valid where it matches my regular expression for matching email addresses. And if it's not valid, I return this message here, that that's not a valid email. So this is how I create myself a type using Moose. And this can go really anywhere in your program. Most people have like a separate file with all the types in it. Once I've done that, then I can simply say, has an email, is read writable, and it is an email. Now, if anything ever tries to set that to something which is not a valid email address, I end up with an exception. And that's absolutely fantastic. Now, if you've been working with Moose for a while, you probably know it's a wonderful framework, although it's a little bit heavyweight. So if you're looking for something which gives you like the most useful bits of Moose, but not like everything in the world, there's this syst wonderful system called Moo. And Moo gives you, quite seriously, three-fifths of Moose. Um, so I actually do a lot of my development in Moo because it's very, very lightweight. It has uh, a lot fewer dependencies. Um, but it's also 100% compatible with Moose. So if somebody loads it up into a Moose system, it all works just fine. Writing methods in Moose, well, we know how to write methods in Perl. We make ourselves a subroutine, and then we have this thing called at underscore, and we unpack it, and, and wait a second, at, at underscore. At underscore. Who likes this variable? OK, I feel so no, I don't feel sorry for you. I'm glad for that. Every time I encounter at underscore, in a piece of code, I just have this rage. It's like, what the hell is that doing there? I mean, I mean, seriously, it's kind of like the Stone Age, like wants their method calling signatures back. Like, who d every other language in the world, you can say, here is what I'm taking. In Perl, it's like, I've got a bunch of stuff. I've got to try and figure out what the hell is in here. It's just, it's awful. So I, I despise at underscore. I never want to see at underscore in my code. Um, and there's this wonderful mod module called method signatures. Now, this is not just writing methods. You can use this to write functions as well. Um, but it works beautifully uh, if you are writing methods. So how does that work? I'm going to show you a real world example. Um, there's this uh, Beeminder. Some of you might have heard of it. They're a local Portland company. Um, and they do these wonderful graphs of like, you know, here's when I've gone to dance lessons. And if I don't go to dance, les dance lessons, I actually get fined. Uh, this is me making sure I go to dance lessons. Um, or here's my inbox size. If I don't keep my inbox size going downwards, I get fined for that. So it's a way of motivating me by charging me money if I don't do what I want. So I maintain it's great. I absolutely adore it. Um, my dentist is so happy. I've like flossed my teeth three times a week for like last year. It's great. 
So there's this uh, module that I maintain called Web Service Beaminder that sort of hooks into their API. And it uses method signatures. And the way in which you write a method in that is rather than having a subroutine, you use the keyword method so you know it's a method. Then you give it a name. And then you have a descriptive layout here of what does it take. So it takes a string. Notice I can use types in this. It takes a string, which is a goal. And it takes a number, which is a value. What's these extra bits of punctuation? The colon says this is a named parameter. So I'm going to say uh, number equals 3 or goes to 3. And the exclamation mark says it's required. It's got to be there. I can also have an integer, which is a timestamp. Um, it's a named parameter, but it's optional. There's no exclamation mark there. And likewise, I can have uh, a comment, and I can have a, a Boolean value, whether I send the user an email when this data point gets updated. And uh, these actually have defaults. So I can put defaults in there as well. This is all part of method signatures. And then once I've done that, you know, I can set my timestamp if it's not already set. And I can go off and do whatever my work is. This isn't real code. We don't have a method called Frobnicate. But you know, that's what I'm off doing, you know, doing something with the API. Yes, you have a question. What's this? OK, Th I'm so glad you asked. This is defined or. So a regular, a regular or with a double vertical bar gives you the left-hand side if the left-hand side is true. Otherwise, it gives you the right-hand side. This gives you the left-hand side if the left-hand side is defined. Otherwise, it gives you the right-hand side. So if my time is 0, if my timestamp comes in as 0, that's, of course, midnight 1970. I don't want to suddenly replace that with now. And this makes sure that doesn't happen. It only sets timestamp if it was originally undefined. Um, this is 5, 10, and above, and it's absolutely wonderful, and I adore it. No pun intended. No pun intended. Well, did I have a pun in there? You said, you adore it. Adore it. Adore it. Oh, of course, because it's also called the door operator. Yes, OK. Yes, no, definitely no pun intended, since you had to explain it to me. <laughs> so <laughs> look how funny I am. So here's an example of me calling that method. Uh, my goal, my value, my comment, yes, I want to send some mail. And in an ideal world, that would work perfectly. Of course, it's not an ideal world. There is actually a bug in my code. And it's not with method signatures. It's actually with how I'm talking to the API. So Perl has these ideas, these Boolean values of true and false. And you know, canonically, we use you know, 1 as a true value and 0 as a false value. Um, you can use other things in Perl. Uh, but these are the ones you most commonly see people using. Um, the API, the Bminder, actually uses these strings. There's like a JSON layer underneath. And it uses these strings of true and false to be true and false values. Now, of course, Perl considers both of these to be true. And Bminder doesn't know what the hell's going on with 1 and 0. So everything totally fails when I try to use Boolean values. Luckily for us, we can actually tell Perl how to convert between the two. So here I am making a subtype called a bbool, which is a Boolean that Bminder can understand. It's a string, but it's a string which is either true or false. It's either one of those two things. And then what I can then do is I can say I can coerce a bbool from a regular Boolean value by looking at my Boolean value. And if it's true, I use the string true. And if it's false, I use the string false. So now I know how to convert from a regular Perl Boolean value to a, a b Boolean value. And likewise, I can do the reverse. I can coerce a Boolean value from a b Boolean value by simply saying, is it equal to the string true? And that will do the right thing, getting it back to a Perl Boolean value. The wonderful thing about this I now have these new types of Booleans. I know how to convert between them. I don't have to convert between them. All I do is I say, this here wants a B bool. It's going to default to false, and it does coerce. And if I get passed in a regular Perl Boolean value, it'll get converted to a B Boolean value automatically. If somebody passes in a B Boolean value, true or false, nothing happens. It, it just works the way you want. So this is absolutely fantastic for getting things into the types you want. You need to explicitly say does coerce, because you don't want magic happening where you don't expect it. This is amazing if you're working uh, with timestamps or with dates. So if you have something like this, year, month, and day, and you want to turn that into a date time object, that's really, really simple. You can say I can coerce a string into a date time by doing this code. And it does it for you absolutely automatically. And in fact, you can even do some cool things even if you don't have a full type mechanism. Um, so here's part of my code from Habit RPG, which lets you get experience points for like doing conference talks and stuff. And um, what I've got here is a type. And rather than defining a, a full uh, type constraint, I've simply said it has to be Habit Daily To Do or Reward, which are these four different things which Habit RPG understands. So you might see here also I'm using a few things with regular expressions. 
Um, and in fact, I love regular expressions. They're one of the big reasons I learned Perl. Um, one of the amazing things which I'm very excited about are 510 regular expressions. Now, 510 has been around for a while. And sorry, I was just taking my time there. 510 has been around for a while, but not all of you may have seen the regular expressions that come with it. So this is a really scary regular expression. Um, this here, um, each individual part is easy to understand. I know that's a bunch of spaces. I know that's a bunch of digits. Um, but in its entirety, what the hell is that doing? This is the same regular expression, um, but I put the x modifier at the end. So this allows me to add spaces and indentation and comments. I can now say, ah, oh, that looks like it's parsing the results of ls minus l, if you ever want to do that. The gotcha here, of course, is that if you want to find out what's your file size, um, you've got to go through and count parentheses, because they're numbered $1, $2, $3, $4. There's a problem. What if your parentheses change? What if instead of this code here, where I can go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, I've got this code here, which has something which has been interpolated in, and now I have an undefined number of parentheses. I don't know how many parentheses are in there, and now I don't know how all these are numbered. They could, and in fact, if that changes, it can renumber all the rest. So Perl 510 has this amazing thing, named captures, named parentheses. Yeah. So I've got my regular parentheses here, question mark angle brackets, I'm giving them a label. Notice I don't have comments in here anymore because it's self-commenting code. These are my permission, these are my links, this is my user, so on and so forth. Now I don't have to refer to things by $123. Instead, I can say file name, dollar plus file name, or I can say dollar plus size. So this gives you a much, much easier way of extracting information from regular expressions and a much more resilient way as well. You never have to worry about those parentheses changing. If you have multiple parentheses with the same name, there is a syntax for doing that as well. I'm just not showing it here. And it gets better as well because I can do things like this. Um, QR, if you haven't encountered it before, gives me a regular expression fragment. So it's something which I compile at this point, but I don't execute at this point. So here I've got a regex fragment, uh, which I've called title, which matches one of these titles, but it also saves it into this title uh, parentheses here. And now over here, I've got a similar thing where I match a bunch of word characters, but it puts it into this name capture. And now when I start writing regular expressions, they become a lot more descriptive. Dear title name. And I can then extract them with title and name down here. If I'm transferring money, I might have a money type and an account type and a date type. And then I say, I'm looking for a line which says I transferred money from account to account on date. And it much, it's much, much easier to understand what's going on with my regular expressions. These are also much, much easier to test as well, because you can put them into their own little library, test the hell out of it. The other thing which is a very recent development, and I'm talking like the last 18 months sort of thing, um, is regex debugger. Has anyone here used regex debugger? Oh man, you are in for a treat. So, regex debugger is two things. It is a module that you can load into your code, and it turns on this uh, regular expression debugger, but you can also run it directly from the command line using RxRx. So I'm going to do something which I recommend people never do in conference talks, which is a live demo. And I'm going to pop over to uh, here. I'm going to pop over to this over here. Here we go. So here I've got regex debugger. Um, hopefully you can all see what's going on there. Um, I'll see if I can maybe drag that up a little bit more. OK. So what you can see here um, is I've got, here's my regular expression, uh, which is the exact same regular expression I had before um, of parsing the ls minus l line. Here is a string which I'm parsing. And the way in which I started this was simply rx, rx space name of my program. So it's found the first regular expression. Here it is doing things. And what I can do here is I can use next to go along. It's testing to see if it's the start of the line. We're satisfied. That's happened. We're capturing to $1 and to permissions. And uh, it says, OK, I'm trying this character class one or more times. And that matched. And now, holy crap, what's in $1 and permissions? It tells me. It tells me what's in there. This is amazing. And then we keep on going. And it tries a white space character, and that matched, and it goes in dollar two. And because I've resized my screen, you can't see that properly. Oh no, there we are. That's number one, and we go along here, and da, 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 and it works. It's really, really cool. What else can I do with this? Don't have my laptop fall off. That's bad. Okay. What else can I do with this? I can actually do uh, a change of displays. 
So I can do heat maps, which I'll show you in a second. I can export JSON uh, information. I can take snapshots of my current visualization so I can load them up afterwards and so on and so forth. And if I scroll up here a little bit, what's that? I can step backwards. Holy smokes. So I can be here. I can go backwards in my regular expression. And I can go forward in my regular expression. And I can sort of continue all the way through it and see all the way in which it matches. This is really, really cool. And then I can switch to heat map mode, and it shows me which bits took the most time. Now, in this case here, nothing in here is taking a particularly longer amount of time. I mean, these things took longer because it's like, hey, I'm doing these multiple matches and everything. But if you want to quickly profile a regular expression, you load it up in here, you run it on your test data, you switch it to a heat map, and the bit which is glowing red, that took up most of your time in the regular expression. So this is a totally, totally awesome tool, and I cannot recommend it enough. Um, you do want to have newer versions of Perl to get this running, um, but it's wonderful, absolutely wonderful. Um, for those of you who, who know Damien Conway, that's one of Damien's modules. Yes? Sorry? Um, that's a great question. Um, I think you need 5.12. I'm running, I'm running 5.14, so it's obviously running absolutely fine on 5.14. Um, I think it works on 5.12. I'm not so sure about 5.10. Um, but generally, the later, the better. And certainly for a lot of tools like um, uh, NYTProf and RegEPS Debugger, the later you have, the better. However, you're not going to be, hopefully, you're not running this on your production system. So you can use Perlbrew to install a later version of Perl in your development system, and you can use it anyway, even if you're deploying still to like 5.8 or something like that. So it's wonderful, absolutely wonderful. Back to my slides. Does everyone love how LibreOffice like, doesn't remember where you're up to in your slides? It puts you back at the very, very start. OK, so live demo. Ta-da, done. The other thing which I want to talk about in my remaining uh, 10 minutes, very quickly, um, is web development in Perl. So for some reason, whenever you talk about web development in Perl, uh, it's mandatory to mention these three letters. Um, I don't know why. That's like the worst way to do things. It's <laughs> awful. There are lots of other ways of doing web development in Perl. And um, these here are all, there's a lot more frameworks out than what I've men mentioned here. Um, I've always wanted to learn a better way of doing web development in Perl, but I have this attention span which is limited to 140 characters. So unless you can give me like a complete hello world with a web server integrated into it and 140 characters left with space for a hashtag, which of course becomes a Perl comment, so it all works when you paste it, I'm not interested. And in fact, there's a system which lets me do that. It's called Dancer. So Dancer, oh my goodness, this is Hello World in Dancer. Use Dancer. When you get my root directory, return Hello World and dance. That says I'm done. That's all you have to do. That says I'm done. Start the server. And I've highlighted those. You know what they do. How do I run it? I just run it. I don't need to do anything special. Hello.pl, it starts it up. It comes with its own little development server. So you don't have to worry about installing it on some other system. Here it is. It's running on port 3000, entering the development dance floor. I dance a lot in my office. And then if I run something, it gives me back, because I hate using a web browser. I use wget. It gives me back Hello World, which is exactly what I want. So that's great with Hello World. Can we make it more fancy? Absolutely. You can say, hey, if I get user followed by a label, which I'm going to give here, then I end up with that label as a parameter, and then I can do something with it. So if you go to uh, my server slash user slash pjf, it says hello pjf, which is fantastic. If you want to do things with HTML, people want to do that on the web sometimes, um, we can have templates. And in fact, you can use practically any templating mechanism you want. Um, this is using Template Toolkit, uh, but you can use things like uh, PHP as a templating mechanism if you want, all the other templating mechanisms available for Perl. And it does it in a very, very clever way. One of the coolest things which I like about this, remember those named captures I just showed you? You can put them in paths. So now, if you're getting slash account slash user, which consists only of word characters, slash ID, which consists only of digits, then it fires off this method here, and I can grab back my, my variables, and then I can then push them into my template or do whatever I want with them as appropriate. This is really, really cool, because now there's a whole bunch of checking I don't have to do. Likewise, I could do something like this. Um, and in fact, this is a really neat uh, development trick. Um, if you're going to slash demo whatever, 
then I have some code that switches me to the demo database and then does an internal forward to wherever I was going. And so this means that I can do stuff, and I'll, I'll show you later on that you can do hooks. You can actually say, whenever I see something going to here, I can do some sort of switch and then pass it on. So internal redirects are super, super easy to do. And in fact, on the method of hooks, you can do stuff like this. Before I serve any content at all, if I'm not logged in, change my request to be the login path. So make sure that the person does log in first. And then you never have to worry about authentication. You can just do this sort of stuff. I do a lot of work in writing uh, web services. Um, so things which are talking to machines rather than talking to people. And in fact, if you want to be returning JSON from uh, your dancer calls, it's simply as simple as saying, set my serializer to be JSON, and then I return a Perl data structure. It turns it into JSON for me and squirts it over the, the wire. So this is great. I adore Dancer. It is super, super, super easy to get running with it. If you want to learn more about that, uh, pearldancer.org. And the last part talking about web stuff is Plaque. Who here has used Plaque? Oh, sweet. OK, you'll love this. Plaque is glue. Um, the idea of Plaque is it's this middleware layer. And everything uh, down the bottom, all of your application stuff, Plaque knows how to talk to everything. So uh, CGI, Mason, Dancer, Catalyst, all those sorts of things, Plaque knows how to talk to them. And on the other side, it knows how to talk to all of your engines. So uh, Mod CGI and Apache and Fast CGI and Nginx and all these other sorts of things. So when you write your application, you just write it for Plaque. And then you take Plaque and you put it on whatever server you want. Plaque also comes with its own server. So if you're doing testing, you can do a Plaque up of my Hello program, which I had before. And of course, it just runs. And it's running on port 5,000 instead of 3,000. At this point, you're saying, OK, so, so what? You know, we've got this Plaque thing. So what? Well, Plaque gives you the ability to add in middlewares. And these are totally cool. So you know, typical thing you want to do is compress data as it goes out if your client supports that. That's just the middleware in Plaque. You don't have to change your application. You can just slot it in with a configuration file. No code changes. You might want to cache things. Plaque has a cache layer. You might want to add e tags, which says, hey, here's the content I've generated, and you can check to see if you need to regenerate it. That sort of stuff is simple in Plaque, and including things down to authentication. Make sure this person has this cookie and it corresponds to a session in the database, et cetera, et cetera, without you ever having to change your application. So I'm going to show you uh, what I get with this particular config file. Um, here I've enabled compression, but I've also enabled a debug panel. Now, be aware this debug panel I can add to any application that's written in Perl, regardless of the framework it's using, just by using that uh, application under Plaque. So I'll show you what uh, that looks like. If I pop over here, um, this, this is Triller, which is a Twitter clone that I wrote as a, as a proof of concept. And uh, you can see here there's a bunch of, of trilling that's been going on with various uses and stuff. And on the right-hand side here, there's this little question mark. Now, that question mark is not from my application. That question mark has been dynamically generated by Plaque. Um, and the JavaScript has been injected into this page. And if I click on that, it gives me this little panel. And then I can see what's my environment running on that server. I can see what was my response like. I can see how long did it take to process this query if I want to be doing benchmarks. This is fantastic. This lets me see if I'm leaking memory. So here, you can see that I used 16 more kilobytes after serving this request than I was using before I was serving this request. And if I keep on doing things and that number keeps on getting bigger, I've probably got a memory leak somewhere. This is absolutely amazing. This is all the SQL that I ran as the process of my query. So here you can see me connecting to my database. Um, down here you can see me doing a prepare. You can see me doing an execute. I'm doing a fetch row array. You can actually trace all of your SQL that is running to generate the results which you've got here. And I've got some other things as well, my dancer version, my dancer settings, how it's logging it, et cetera, et cetera. You can write your own panels for this. Like you can write your own panels which do whatever it is that you want to be doing to add this debug layer. So this is marvelous. Being able to add that to any Perl application at all without changing the application is amazing. So Plaque is fantastic when you want to get things working. So back to here, I've got less than five minutes. So the very last thing I'm going to talk about is code review. There's this wonderful book called Perl Best Practices. Um, I, all re I recommend that you definitely get it. Uh, but there's this gotcha of what if you're too lazy to read the book? So there's this great thing called Perl Critic that I hope some of you have encountered before. 
um, Perl Critic has already read Perl best practices, and it's a command line tool. So what you can do, I'm going to take my hat off so you can see more easily. Um, what you can do is you can run Perl Critic over your command, and it says, I'll tell you if there's thing, things that you're doing wrong. Now, in this case, this is over my Minesweeper bot that I wrote a couple of years ago because I was playing a lot of Minesweeper, and it's like a repetitive task, and I'm a sysadmin, so you automate it. Um, <laughs> it it's super fast. It's like the world's fastest Minesweeper bot. Um, and Perl Critic here is saying, you know, it's, everything's OK. Now, I know that my code is actually pretty crappy, so I can tell you, no, Perl Critic, I want you to be stern with my code. And if I put it in stern mode, it actually comes back with a whole bunch of, of warnings here. Now, something to note, it'll say here, see pages 81 and 82 of Perl Best Practices. So if I have the book sitting next to me, I can run Perl Best Practices, or Perl Critic, I can open up my book, you can tell me why what I'm doing is a bad idea. There's a whole bunch of different modes you can run it in. Uh, gentle, stern, harsh, cruel, and brutal. I, I aim to get things passing on harsh. Anything sort of down here is a little bit too brutal for me. If you don't have Perl best practices, and I know I'm almost out of time, uh, you can turn on this verbose mode. And the verbose mode actually gives you the community contributed documentation as to why what you're doing is a bad idea. So you don't ever have to actually read the book. And then you can say, but hang on a second, you're complaining about constants, which I enjoy using. So I can actually turn off warnings about a particular pragma. At this point, you say there's too many options. So you can put them in your Perl Critic RC file. And then there's my Perl Critic RC file. There I am running. Everything works. Why is Perl Critic RC file fantastic? You can put it in your home directory. So that can be your personal coding standard that you normally use. But you can also put them in project directories, which means that for this project, this is my project's coding standard. And anybody who's working on that project is running Perl Critic with that project standard, which is amazing. And I love it. It means other people have to write code the way I want them to. So this also lets you test everything. You can run it on a directory. You can do Perl test, critic, uh, test Perl Critic, which puts it in your test suite. You can change the existing rules. You can write your own rules. You can test it online if you go to that page. But don't upload like your super sensitive code because it's not encrypted. And like the NSA will read it all. And, um, and there's also, if you're wondering, how do I learn about every single module that Paul has mentioned in this talk, and I'm out of time, you look at this thing called Task Can Show. Ken Show is Enlightenment, and these are all of the enlightened modules, which includes everything I've shown you today, and about a billion more. And I love it. I've got one minute left. Um, also, you want to go look at modernpearlbooks.com. There is a free book there. It's Chromatics blog. It's fantastic. So hopefully, with the information which I've given you today in my remaining 30 seconds, you will have an amazing time with the Pearl Renaissance, and you will write good code. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. So I think I've got 15 seconds for questions. <laughs> Great. If you have questions, tweet them at me. <laughs> and I believe I'm now passing over to our next speaker who may be in the room. No, sweet. OK, cool. Sorry? No, it's not. So it's 2.16? Wait, have I? Oh, there's a keynote. Oh, OK, cool. Cool. Well, if you want to ask me questions, grab me at coffee, because oh my goodness, I love coffee. <laughs> and come to my other talk, which is on Thursday, I believe. Cool. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>